two writers, one just starting out, the other a bestseller. Join James Blatch and Mark Dawson and their amazing guests as they discuss how you can make a living telling stories. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast with Mark Dawson and James Blatch. And this is the third and final episode we're recording in person at the London Book Fair, which is why you can hear a bit of hubbub in the background. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the Amazon stand behind us. Oh, it's me. Look at that. There's a big picture of me. Adorning the Amazon How stand. Is, uh, with a, what do you think of the kind of brush stroke effect? Yeah, I don't know. But um, I know um, Amazon mentioned that foot traffic is down since my, my picture is plastered <laughs> on the side of the stand. So sorry about that, Amazon. Sorry, Jeff. And you've got, uh, who else have we got? I think Rachel oh, Abbott is on one side. Abbott. Rachel's stranded in Guernsey. She can't make it. Um, Alderney. Alderney, okay. Alderney, yes. Yeah. So Rachel Abbott is, she's been on the podcast before and um, lives in Alderney. And it's been too rainy for them to land at the airstrip. So she's uh, stuck there, and Louise Ross is here. Oh, Jay and, Ross. Yeah. Um, Joseph Alexander, who's also been on the podcast, is, has been on the panel with me this morning and then tomorrow and the next day. So, yeah, yeah fun. So, fun. the way these fairs work, I mean, they're pretty old. I don't know how long this book fair's been going, probably since the 1930s or something. But uh, you get the big publishing companies who will do deals, well, they will sign authors in some cases and do rights deals, although Frankfurt's more of a rights place, I think. Up here is the more modern aspect of it. It's happened in the last few years. It's called Author. HQ, a little bit more writer-centric, so some of the sessions that take place here are practical sessions on social media advertising, uh, marketing your book. I only there's a course about that. If only there was some sort of <laughs> online course about it. But I don't know whether you've touched on the subject of uh, reviews, negative reviews, how to deal with them in any of these sessions that have ever been asked? No, no one's asked me that that I can remember. Well, certainly not today anyway, but no, it's something that comes up. It is something that comes up, and it's something that every author has to deal with, right? They do, yes. So bad reviews are kind of part and parcel of the territory, So, which, which makes me... Rem- I thought I'd uh, read a couple out. Oh, have you got some? Uh, yeah, I've got loads. Well, surely there's no negative reviews so, of your no, books. No, no, I get... So Jake... Hello, Jake. Hello, if you're Jake. Listening. Um, Jake says, boring and very difficult for me to understand a lot. Mm. Says more about you than me, Jake. Um, and uh, where's another one? Too much gang violence? Well, Start out strong with a compelling character. <laughs> I discontinued reading it, not for me. So those are actually quite nice bad reviews. I've had, um, I don't know how many reviews I've had over the years. Probably, it's in the thousands, certainly. And l- luckily, most of them are very nice. Uh, so f- fours and fives. But I've had plenty of one-star stinkers. And um, I remember the first one I got was crushing. Really yeah. knocked me for six. And, and doubted my ability as a writer. Confidence was knocked. But then you realise after another one comes in, and then another one comes in, you, you look at you either look at them or you don't look at them or you compare them with uh, with the better reviews that you get. Um, and over time, it's something that I can laugh about now. It isn't something that bothers me too much. It comes from the territories, as I said. Um, you have to expect them. And yeah. then you, you, know, you mustn't let them knock you. Uh, just get back on the horse again and, and, and carry on. Good. Well, today's podcast interview is specifically about bad reviews and how to cope with them. But also with, uh, with Molly McCord, she helps you categorise them so you understand what type of review they should fall into and that will help you decide what to do about it, which might be as Mark says, ignoring it, might be taking on some way for some of the advice. Uh, there's a handout that goes with this. If you listen to the interview, you'll find out uh, the link to go to for that. So let's hear from Molly now. So Molly, uh, welcome to the Self Publishing Formula podcast. It's really good to have you on. Um, I know you're in sunny Florida, but you're in a because it's so sunny, all the curtains are closed, but it looks dark. But no, it's, you're in a nice part of hot world. Yes, it's wonderful to have the sunshine every day and to be able to get outside to take a break from the writing desk. Um, yeah, I, I can't complain. I can't complain. And I've just found out that you live on the Space Coast. You're at Cape Canaveral with the rockets launching in your back garden almost. And I'm very jealous. Yes, and we can see them from the back of our house, which is really amazing. So it's a pretty exciting place to be right now. There's a lot going on here. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Well, we'll um, we'll try and catch a launch next summer in Florida. Okay. So, Molly, we're going to talk to you. First of all, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your writing before we move on to the main topic of our our conversation? 
Absolutely. Well, I think I have a story that many authors can relate to um, in terms of the starts and stops of a career. I started my first book in 2008. And at that time, uh, there, of course, was nothing online in terms of Kindle platforms or anywhere to go. And so I was going through the typical process of trying to find an agent. And I had rejection and rejection and rejection. And that uh, paused what I was doing because I thought, is this really going to happen? And so I actually took some time off from writing and lo and behold, eventually the Kindle platform came available years later. Um, and I finally had the ability to take it forward on my own and to really put it out there, which is exciting and scary. But I thought I can finally really do this. And so it wasn't until 2013 that I published my first book and I launched it. It was called The Art of Trapeze. It's a travel memoir. And I had been writing other books in the meantime. So I had started all these other books and just thought, well, somehow the road is going to be clear. Somehow I'll be able, I'll know what to do with all this. And so I published and I ended up launching that first book three times. And I was doing a lot of research to figure out how do people get out there? How do you get a book out there these days? Because um, especially back in 2013, um, what were the options? What were you supposed to do? So I researched it and I found all the various ways to advertise online. And eventually I found BookBub. And um, from there, I was able to it was actually really crazy how this happened, but I had um, not been watching my sales. And I saw that my book had risen up in the charts and was right behind 12 Years a Slave wow. in the memoir section. And somehow it was appalling to me because I thought I haven't been marketing. <laughs> so word of mouth helped get this first book out there. And then from there, I was able to secure a BookBub ad and then that just helped bolster a lot of things. So the game is different these days. It's not 2013, um, but we all know how influential BookBub can be. And we all know that there's a lot that goes into being an author, including the importance of reviews. I have since uh, published 12 books. They're all nonfiction titles. Uh, memoir, travel, inspiration, self-help, and I've learned a lot. And so I hope that this topic today on, on bad reviews can just help people understand more about how to categorize it or, or deal with this part of our professional world, because it's one of the few professions, being an author is one of the few professions where you really are required to get reviews to be valid and to be successful. I, I, I guess I couldn't think of any other professions, James, I don't know if maybe you can, where you you have to have these reviews to demonstrate that you're legit. Yeah, no, no, so that I is wanna... a tough one. I mean, there are reviews around, but famously, some actors notices they call them. I think in the acting industry, uh, so, you know, famously, mm -hmm. some of the older actors just never read their notices. They don't need them. They don't want them. They can upset them. They find it emotionally difficult, and they can do without them. But that's not the case with authors, because as you say, your reviews are a part and parcel of your marketing and the validation that you know that your potential readers are going to check them. So you've got to be aware of them as well. So there's no real avoiding them, is there? There isn't, and there's an expectation of reviews. You know, I, as a reader, expect to see reviews. You expect to have that community feedback. And so it's a really interesting uh, world that we're in as authors because we need them, and yet they can be really difficult at times. So I guess I'd, I'd like to help other authors kind of feel more confident with those, those bad reviews or, or as they pop up. Yeah, so we'll get into some of that in a moment, the psychology. I'm also interested in the fact that you're making a you know a career out of non-fiction because we do talk to lots of fiction authors um, and uh, the non-fiction authors are fewer. They're not, not there, but they're fewer. Uh, and it's a question Mark gets asked a lot. As a fiction author, when we talk, he gives out a lot of advice and help. And people often say, I'm writing non-fiction. Is the sort of thing you're talking about does that work for nonfiction as well? So perhaps we can have a quick bite from you on, on that subject, like the, the whole sort of Facebook advertising um, and the, the book Barbie talked about. Yes. All of this works for, for nonfiction? No, 
nonfiction is different. And I work in a lot of smaller genres that don't have the same robust marketing behind them, such as, you know, fiction authors, um, of course, Mark, you know, all his work with the series, the different series. I don't have that in my arsenal. I have to do very specific advertising on Facebook, for example. Um, I have to really cultivate relationships uh, with my readers who I know are advocates of what I'm sharing or saying and ask for their word of mouth. Um, the I can't even advertise some of my books through the typical um, email newsletters, for example, because there isn't that defined audience out there. Now, I do believe that audience is actually out there, but it's not the same. You, you don't go through the same process to find them as you do for fiction. So nonfiction is very I actually think think of it as very exciting because it has a lot of potential, but you have to work to find it. Um, I use AMS, um, uh, Amazon Marketing Services, that has really been the best for nonfiction in my experience. I have a travel book on Paris and, and seeing the best in Paris. And that has been, AMS has worked well for that. But I have to find these sub target markets. Um, it requires more work. So it's definitely a lot more to it, I think, to, have, to be a nonfiction author these days. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's true. And it's something um, when I'm typing out my replies to people who often ask us, particularly in relation to the, the courses that we produce, do they work for nonfiction? And I often find myself pointing out that one thing that all fiction authors have in common is that their market are readers. They're people who read books. But that, funnily enough, weird as it sounds, is not the case with nonfiction. Your market mm -hmm. is people who have problems and they are looking yes. to solve a problem or answer a question. And that's a different type of marketing and a different type of person and a different audience from fiction. Absolutely, because you could say that fiction readers are looking for a an escapism, if you will, whereas nonfiction readers are looking for a reality check or something to help them right here and now. And so the way to monetize that I have found is to really be developing more services for those people that find your books so that you can make money off of, say, another online program or class or one on one coaching. And that I think is really the best model these days. That's that's how I actually make a living is more of the one on one um, than, you know, the book sales are the starting point. So um, there's there's ways to be creative with this um, and you just have to have different expectations because it's a, it is a different different genre to be working with right yeah. now. OK, well, that's good to have that little snippet. And um, uh, maybe we'll have you on again specifically and we'll talk about uh, nonfiction and uh, and how oh, to yeah. address that. And uh, I think that would be a really useful episode, actually. We should perhaps I'll talk to Mark. We did a nonfiction series ooh, some time ago when the podcast was a baby podcast, but it could be time to revisit that. Anyway, let's move on to this psychological thing that is the review. And everybody loves it when you read a five-star review. And there's nobody on earth, whatever they say to you, who's completely unmoved by reading a hurtful one-star oh. review, right? Right. It can be that punch in the gut. It can be blindsiding. It's typically emotional and you find yourself maybe, I, I can only speak for myself, you find the emotional stuff coming up and then you maybe want to squash it with an intellectual understanding and reasoning. Um, it's, it's hard. And I think the other part of these uh, bad reviews is that they're public. And you think, well, if I had a job and I was speaking to my supervisor in my nine to five, this would be private and it would be between the two of us. But this is public. And frankly, that can be one of the hardest things psychologically to deal with is that the public bad review. And so I feel that as authors, again, we're in this unique role of, well, we have to be detached. And of course, we know everyone's entitled to their opinion. You know, how many times have we heard that? But there's also the sense of, but this is my work, or this is my passion, this is my contribution to the world, and it, 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 it's hurtful when you get that feedback. And I think it's important to deal with it at that human level too. In other words, it's inevitable that people are going to take it personally, because it's a bit of you. This is a creative endeavor, right? Absolutely, and I think especially those first bad reviews. And so we could even break this up into saying, well, if you're a new author versus if you have a few books under your belt, it has a different effect. But that first book and those first 
the first bad review, it just, it gets to you. And I remember my first one, I actually was in a restaurant with my husband and I was scrolling on my page, my book page, just to see if anything was happening. And I remember reading this bad review and I thought, and I was just so blindsided and perhaps as my own being naive, but of, of course the bad review would show up, but it just, it really got me and I felt so caught off guard. And I've been in many author groups where authors say the same thing. It just, you know, they were blindsided, they didn't realize it. And, and I think that it's okay when you have that experience to just sit with it because part of being a professional author is understanding your own experiences of this whole journey. And it's it's the stuff that comes up along the way that's private and that you deal with um, that helps you get stronger. And we all have our own unique process with that, but it's also a good idea to be a part of these author groups to get the good feedback. You know, I mean, there's many author groups out there right now that that when you have a bad review, the authors are gonna come forward and they'll be able to commiserate. They, they will help lift you up. You don't have to be it, in it alone. And so that's, um, I think that's important too for yeah. the support of it. That's a great thing about this community. And we, we can't say it enough really how uh, that supportive nature of the self-publishing community is. Uh, it's a lifesaver for some people and um, we've experienced it here you know I mentioned on a podcast a few podcasts back that we had a fairly vitriolic attack on the way that I do my interviews and so on and I probably you know we always banter a bit me and Mark at the beginning is when I mentioned it but probably subconsciously mentioned it because I knew that I would get some support from people and I did and people wrote to me and emailed me and said I just want to tell you you do a great job I'm not asking for this again yeah. but it meant a lot to me at the time and I, yep. I did sub whether deliberately or semi subconsciously reached out to the community to get a bit of a bolster at a time when um, you've taken a bit of a kicking. And that's, you know, just my personal experience, but for our Facebook groups, our communities, that is there for you. There are people who are, yes. who, who know where you are, how you're feeling and want to do their bit to raise you up again. Because you can feel vulnerable, you can feel hurt, you can feel, feel pissed. I mean, everything can come up, but just know that you're not the first person. And you need to hear that feedback because it will help you move through it faster. I think the other thing that comes up is that you start to hear from authors how they deal with it. And, and that helps you figure out how you're going to deal with it too. Um, and there's also another sense here that, well, congratulations, you've arrived. You know, you're mm. officially valid. Once, once you have had someone um, publicly or, or privately even, um, you know, give you this kind of feedback. There is a there is a sense of you've made it because now you're real. You don't you have another side of the coin to consider with your writing or what you're putting out there. We should differentiate, I suppose, um, constructive feedback, which can obviously yes. is it be an important part of being an author. Uh, and you need yes. you need to be able to take that that kind of critique, if you like. Uh, and I guess that can come from readers. I mean, Mark has mentioned that some people have said to him. Sometimes it's technical, slightly scary comments, like that's not how the Glock 9 millimeter works. And he goes, oh, okay, you're right, it isn't, I have to change that. Uh, and sometimes it's a kind of dismissive, nobody would act like that. And I think Mark's sanguine enough to think maybe there's a point there. So there is, there is a differentiator here between the kind of person who just says something negative and the person who gives something that could be useful to you. Absolutely. And something that I, I created is five different types of bad reviews um, to help myself categorize it. And we could just go through those now if you wanted. But sure. I feel like that's right away. There is something that I, I've just called it's a valid bad review, which means it's your target market, your target reader. They like your work. But there's some things about maybe this book that they they had something off for them or they want to actually help you improve going forward. Uh, perhaps their word choice isn't the best, but there's something that they're giving you that's meant to be constructive criticism. And that kind of a bad review, quote unquote, can be say a one star or a two star, or maybe it's a three star. And I don't know that, I don't think a three star is naturally a, a bad review. That could be a neutral review, but they're giving you something useful to consider. And maybe it doesn't feel that way right away, but after you digest it and think about it, you say, oh, sure, well, that makes sense. And I didn't think about that. Okay, 
got it, you know, moving on. So I think that kind of a bad review is what you're what you're talking about too, James, is that sense of, well, there's something good in here. It just is coming out as, as a negative review. Yeah. And there is, um, you know, you, you get taught in your first couple of hours of, of any kind of management school of how to deliver negative feedback and there's a clever way of right. doing it but there's a reason there's a clever way of doing it. it's because we're humans right and if you just bluster into somebody um and tell them everything that's gone wrong and walk out the room what are they going to think but if you say to them i loved everything you did yesterday really love the way you're moving forward got a couple of things for you just to uh and suddenly it's a lot more palatable but the guy or girl who's writing on the amazon review board may not necessarily want to sugarcoat it so we, well, we should be aware right. of that Yes, I think that's a brilliant point because, yeah, and, and people think they, you know, maybe they don't even realize what exactly they're saying or how it's coming across. I mean, there's the whole spectrum of human communication styles to take yeah. into consideration. Um, the other thing that I think is important, too, is that my philosophy, at least, and I just offer it out there, is I believe the author has the full book to say what they need to say and that reviews are really for readers. And so, yes, you'll read your reviews, but it's okay to have a playground for readers to say what they need to say and to have that just be something you can step back from. Um, you know, we've heard the stories about authors who have responded to bad reviews and that never goes well. And there's also stories out there of authors who respond to good reviews and that can also work against you because a reader might not want you to respond or might not expect that. So I feel like there's something to be said about the fact that, you know, if you could just allow reviews to be for readers and to give yourself some, some space from that, just, just feel okay that you don't even need, there's nothing for you to, to say or do to, to massage it, if you will. Yeah. As a slight tangible, we should also acknowledge that this is quite a modern phenomenon because of the internet. Um, people, perhaps, you know, authors got letters on the odd occasion from somebody who went to the effort to tell them that they didn't like their book, but they would have been few and far between. Today, it's easy, and you know, my kids are 14 and 12, so they're growing up in an age where if somebody's got something critical to say about you, it's on your phone in a moment. So maybe they'll be better equipped to deal with this than our generation who are suddenly being exposed to it. And you look too at how everything has progressed online for readers and, and authors, and you know, it's more commonplace now to write a review and to submit a review, whereas when it was first a novel thing, it was really, it was just a different experience to say, oh, I can say anything I want. Well, I feel like maybe we've become a little bit more sophisticated in, well, I only gonna say certain things online or I don't want that to come back to work against me. I mean, I feel like the even the world of reviews these days you know, fingers crossed, is a little bit more sophisticated and moving in that direction so that when people do post certain reviews, um, you know, they have an idea for, for what is really beneficial to the readers and the authors and what is just, you know, mean and, and nasty. So, yeah. So you mentioned you, you've categorized reviews into, yes. into five categories. I mean, uh, I don't know, because one option here for you, and I'm speaking on the fly in the middle of the interview, is if you had the opportunity to put perhaps a PDF together with these five, would that be something you, you could do for our audience? That'd be superb, because I think people would love to have a little handy guide of, of how to categorize them and maybe a line of how to deal with each one. Absolutely. That would yes, be, I can do that. No problem. That'd be super yeah. money. So should we have a quick uh, sort of pricey of them then uh, now? Yes, let's go. Okay. So um, number one being that valid bad review that your target reader, target market, and they just have feedback for you and, and it is what it is. Um, the second kind of review is highly opinionated. And this is the person who either they love it or they hate it. And when they hate it, they just really hate it. And that's how they are in the world or that's how they are in, in anything they experience. They just have maybe it's emotional charge or passion and you know they have a lot to say on the topic. Uh, perhaps you're writing about something that that they're an expert on and you know they just that are a topic that they just really couldn't get into i mean the highly opinionated ones are those one star reviews that that really go into a long paragraphs of of information and i think that's just understanding well this is a this is a person with a lot to say and that's that's who they are so i think highly opinionated is is a key one to understand yeah um a third one 
is I think the hardest ones to take are the personal attacks. Mm -hmm. And a personal attack is where it's not even about the book. It's about you. It's someone who either perhaps knew you when or knows you now or they have, you know, a score to settle with you. The personal attack is something that's very real for authors. And I've heard many stories in author groups about the personal attacks they've experienced. These are the ones that hurt the most, but these are the ones too that aren't even about the book. And so one thing I want to call out here is to understand that Amazon has their community guidelines. And you should look at what their community guidelines are because these are the requirements for for reviews. And you can review it to say, well, does this book review even match what Amazon is requiring in a review process? And I know just recently Mark did a you marked it a show on the reviews. And it's important to know that Amazon has and I'm speaking specifically about Amazon, but um, they have two customers here. They have the reader and the author. It's in their best interest to ensure that both sets of customers are, are happy. And so what you can do is simply call out in an email if there is a violation of their community guidelines. And just say this review is actually more about da 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 and it's not about the book. Um, you have to include what the review is, perhaps the date and the title of the review, and then send it to Amazon's community group without expectation, because we can't expect bad reviews to be removed, but this has worked. It has. It is something that's worked for some authors where this isn't even about the book and Amazon can see that and they can see that it's uh, disparaging or, or harassing or they, they have a list of things that they require. So I wanna offer that to authors as something to just see um, if you have a review that's not about your work at all, this might be one way to to have that review removed. Yeah, and that's a good differ differentiator between the opinionated review number two, your category, which is somebody who perhaps doesn't even consider the author as a person or feelings looking at the body of work, which is probably fair enough, even if they go into excruciating detail of why they disagree with everything. And number three, mm -hmm which is, and often is, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. It's a, it's, a, it's a personal, it, sometimes dressed up as, as a review of the book, but feels more personal. And you can tell from the, the use of the language that it really is uh, aimed at the author rather than explaining what they felt about the book. And this can show up, I think, especially in nonfiction categories, because you could be dealing with the topic that maybe it's volatile for some people or they have a strong there's something that they 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 really are unhappy with you. Um, I've actually seen in my news feed someone a connection of a connection. This woman was really proud of the one star review she wrote that was scathing to the author. And I couldn't, I, I was just appalled that she was so proud of it, but she was really a, a proud of the fact that she could personally attack somebody publicly. So unfortunately, those personalities mm. are out there. And I think that you as an author have to understand, you know, your rights with it. I also think that it's important to, you know, know that Amazon has, of course, guidelines for a reason and things they have to follow, but they're also savvy. And they can, and so are readers. Readers are intelligent. You know, readers actually understand when these reviews are ridiculous and 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 hurtful. Readers know, so understand that too. That it's you. If it's clear to you, it's it's probably clear to other people too. That it's that it's the a different kind of review. Yeah, because uh, it could ultimately start affecting your work if you do struggle to take. A sort of um, objective look about this or you know a, a contextual look at some of this stuff and I've known you know my time as a BBC reporter I got to know a couple of politicians and uh, I know there are some politicians who are not as good professional politicians as they could be because they can't they couldn't cope with the criticism from the newspapers which goes in the ter with the territory in that job but it was very difficult for me to say to them, you know, this is tomorrow's chip paper, we call it in the UK, because they use newspapers to serve chips in. Tomorrow's chip paper, and the people reading it, the good point you just made is, it's not like everyone sits there reading this review, a bad review, and, and agrees with every word of it, in the same way that they don't right. agree with the tittle-tattle in the newspaper. But that's not always how it feels to you, of course. Someone's put it out right. there, and you think that's what people are thinking. And that's a great point. And I think the other side of the coin here is that sometimes these highly opinionated reviews or the bad reviews or the personal attacks, it actually helps qualify 
your target reader. And they'll say, oh, everything they didn't like about this book, I think I might like. And I've had readers tell me that too. So it doesn't just work against you. I mean, the the one-star review, the two-star reviews, not only demonstrate validity that many different types of people are reading your work or in your book, but it shows that, oh, well, everything that this person doesn't like, I love about books. So it can work for you too. So be sure and see the other side of the coin as well. Okay, should we move on to number four? Yes, let's do it. So this one is what I call a spam, a spam review, which is simply that it doesn't make sense. And you can, there's been an increase in these lately, um, especially for really popular books. Spam reviews, they have nothing to say. They're just ridiculous. And you're like, how does this review even get posted? Um, I actually saw a review on one of my books recently that was only emojis. Right. There was no word. I was like, I left them wordless. <laughs> they, they just left emojis. Do you speak emojis? And emoji? that's because people are looking on their phone. Do you speak emojis? What was that? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean. I, speak, I was like. I'd have to ask my daughter to decipher it, I think. But. Well, this one was pretty clear. I mean, it was actually, it wasn't, it wasn't even a bad review, but it seems spammy because it was only emojis. And I thought, well, you know, this is something that the territory we're moving into when everyone's on their mobile phones and we're used to texting. Well, you can just leave a, a, a silly spam review. So be aware of those. And I know those affect your overall book ranking. So you're aware of those. You're like, well, you don't want spam reviews. And so that's that's another kind to be aware of. And perhaps you can reach out to Amazon's community to see it, what they do around those those reviews. And, and these can also be the trolls. Like these are the people that just write ridiculous reviews and they you're just like, what is this? This has nothing of context or content to offer. Yeah. So spam reviews are are prevalent these days. A sort of review that says more about the person reviewing than it does uh, anything else. Yes, yes, it does. Okay, so that's number four. It does. Good old uh, spam. And then, and then the fifth and final one is I'm just going to call it what it is, and I'm going to call it an idiot review. And this is the person who writes something that is so borderline hilarious that it doesn't even make sense, and you're just thinking. Why did they even write this? And it's it's actually kind of entertaining or funny, but it's a, still a low ranking review. And I've seen these too, where you're like, what is this person talking about? Or they'll even start the review by saying, I didn't even read this book, yeah. but I could tell by the title that I disagree. Da, 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 and you're like, who, who are you? And so these reviews are out there. The idiot reviews are out there. And I think that it is worth seeing, you know, again, what Amazon might do or, or what their guidelines are for these kinds of reviews. Yes, that's the classic, uh, the classic one. We used to get that in the BBC occasionally, a letter saying, I haven't seen the program myself, but I think it should be banned. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yes. Well, why don't you at least watch it? Um, but yes, you are going to get. I mean, there's all sorts out there, right? And that's the, the other thing yes. about the. It brings us back to that point about the internet is we are now exposed to a very wide range of personality types. Oh, it's so true, and it's people that you would never come in contact with, but they have access to the internet and they have access to a computer, and um, they can say what they want to say. Um, I have heard how Goodreads can be a really hard place for reviews because they don't have the same initial requirements as Amazon, meaning now Amazon has imposed a minimum of a $50 purchase before you can write a review. But some platforms don't have any requirements. So people can create fake accounts and, you know, say anything they want to say, which could affect the books, uh, the books reviews in Goodreads. So there's all these different platforms out there. And I find that as I've written more books, that I actually don't pay attention attention to my reviews as much. I, I don't feel that it always is worth my time or it's not needed in my head. Um, I do check on them, of course, but it isn't something I give a ton of attention to at some point for each book. And that has helped set me free, I think, as an author to return to what what am I writing for and, and what is this really about and how is it truly benefiting 
or connecting with readers because that's where I write from and that's what I want. And I think that's what a lot of authors want too, is that you, this is your creative process. And so come back to that as a point of strength for yourself and, and remember why you're doing it for you and, and to not stay too focused on the bad reviews because they do, they do come with this, this territory and this profession. And is that an experience thing, Molly, just over time, you've got more work, more reviews, and you've had you've had the experience being there and done it that you don't feel that you need to pay such attention to it. And I'm thinking of people listening to the podcast who may be in their first one or two books, getting their first one or two reviews. It doesn't feel possible for them at that stage perhaps to ignore them or, or, or not pay that much attention. I think it is part of the process, but it's actually something that I started to require of myself as a professional as a professional who knows that the writing is good and it's going to keep getting better. I mean, I look back on my first works and well, there's some things I would change, but I feel like it's a part of our professional duty to stay strong in ourselves. And so if it makes you feel weak, then you you have to come back to center or come back to um, the fact that, first of all, it happens for every author. It's just part of the territory. It's part of what our reality is. But where can you remain strong in yourself and understand that this is an amazing time to be an author? I mean, just think of everything we're doing as indie authors. Just think of all the options and possibilities and understand that, you know, you you have to it's self-management, I think. I think that's part of what this tr- turns into. And so if something is taking you down a dark spiral or is just too hard, well, then you have to manage that for yourself. One difficult area might be for a new author who is finding uh, his or her way with their writing and gets a few fairly consistent critical reviews. Um that do perhaps need taking on board um, and aren't sugar-coated. Um, you can't, because you can't always dismiss everything, which brings us back, I know, to your early point. Um, right. There's got to be an ability at some point to deal with that, what feel, might feel like a crisis. Yeah, and, and that's very real. And so I, I guess I'm not saying don't ignore this feedback, um, but let it make you better, let it improve you. I think what you need to do is two things. You go to someone you trust to say, hey, can you look at these reviews and tell me, or do they have valid points? You need an objective person to, to kind of tell you, well, they might be onto something and that's worth exploring, or no, this is, you know, this is just temporary nonsense. Like you need to have that objective person you trust. And the second thing is the community groups of, for authors to get the author support and feedback. Cause you'll hear stories from other authors who said, well, that happened to me and this is what I did about it. So it goes back to knowing you're not alone either. Um, but I think the other part of being an indie author is that sometimes, you know, we, we do need to, to understand that we can improve. And there are things that we do need other people to give us feedback on. And like we were talking about earlier, James, there's people who will deliver that information in a very kind and respectful way. And then there's reviewers who don't really care about your feelings necessarily. Yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is that the new authors, you you do need to understand that the feedback and the criticism comes with this territory, um, but go to someone you trust and whose opinions you really value, who are going to give you, you know, the the real gold nuggets here to take forward. Yeah, and that brings us back to the importance of the of the self publishing community or the author community. You don't have to be self published. Uh, yes. Know, the author community uh, who generally within that find your soulmates, and you know. I've, I, I now know because we've got our own SPF community. I speak to so many people who found somebody who they are now very close with, uh, and professionally close with. Uh, they found them through our community, and they'll they'll be those people out there for you. Very important uh, to deal with that. And yeah, and just to underline a point you made in that answer, there is that there's no complete insulation from this. This is not the career to choose if you feel you it's cannot true. cope in any way, shape, or form with criticism. Exactly. And I think um, that is something that we each have to move through individually, that you yourself have to figure out 
you know, it's kind of that giving yourself your own pep talk and your own sense of, well, I'm going to improve and I'm going to make sure that I take what's important and I leave the rest. And I feel that so many authors build their own muscles through this profession. You get stronger, you become a better writer. I mean, you can allow all this stuff to make you better, to improve you. And even if it you know, takes you back or takes you off course for a little bit, it's still your choice to get back in the game or to come back and, and be better and be stronger. So you're never alone with that. And I know the SPF community is awesome about providing more um, support because there's something universal about the reviews and, and how it affects you as a writer, but also what you then choose to do going forward with it. Yeah. So Molly, you've written quite a few nonfiction books, I'm guessing uh, in this area. You've written quite a few, actually, I think, um, overall. So is there somewhere somebody can go for a bit more uh, info on this subject? Or you're kindly going to do a PDF for us, but uh, where do they go to get your inside line on this? Yes, you can find me at mollymccord.online. And that's where I share more more help and guidance for authors. And I just, I really try to remind people that there's such an exciting time to be an author. And I, and I hope that's where you feel inspired to continue with your work and your books. And, um, you know, there's so much good stuff out there these days that there is a way forward. Even if you're stuck, even if you're not sure what to do next, there is a way forward because there's those of us who've been doing it for long enough who can help, you know, guide you and move you forward. So just know that you're never alone. And, um, and, and it's, I, I'm, I love it. I'm, I'm honored. And I, I love this program too. I learned so much from you and Mark and I appreciate what you do. That's very kind of you, Molly. And they're good notes to, uh, to round out the interview on the, to, it's never been a better time to be a writer and you're never alone. Yes. Yes. So have you found any more bad reviews? Yes, I, I have. Uh, two American. Two American? Coffee Lover. It's from Salisbury. Ghetto culture rubbish. Dreadful book. I'd give it zero star if I could. Zero stars. Really, okay. any. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> so let's, that, let's leave that. I um, do. My favourite review is the, the one that you occasionally see somebody leave saying three stars because I haven't actually read this book yet. Yeah, well, I've seen some reviews where they'll say five stars. Excellent delivery. Thank you, Amazon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're so, yeah, oh, you've got to roll with these punches. Um, you can take the good with the bad. So yes, it's um, yeah, you're gonna get you're gonna get bad reviews. If something yeah. you just have to accept. Uh, and Molly, uh, Molly goes great guns. Actually, she's uh, a bit of an entrepreneur. Can we say that? Do you like that word, entrepreneur? I hate it. You uh, hate it. You hate any kind of cliche word. Um, <laughs> But she's published a lot of non-fiction, she's a bit of a guru actually in marketing non-fiction books as well and I thought that's really good practical advice and just a reminder that you can get those, that tip sheet to help you deal with negative reviews, to categorise them and deal with them if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash bad reviews. Good, well I mean... Speaking I did, of reviews... Yes, speaking of reviews... Yeah, I'm a pro. I'm a pro in this. In this, this is a, a link. pro in this partnership. This is a kind of a tenuous link. If you'd like to leave a review for the Self Publishing Formula podcast, yes, it would be very grateful to receive. We've got plenty, but you can uh, go to your favourite podcast service, iTunes, being a good one, and leave a review. That would be uh, very kind. And um, we'd find it bad touching. reviews. Bad reviews are also accepted. If you think James and I are dreadful. Yeah, too American. You get, too much get, gangster violence. Get so culture. Get yeah. culture rubbish. Yeah. Anyway, dope. It's my gang sign. Dope. It was, it was very good. When I was a kid, dope was the glue you used to put FX models together. When I was a kid, dope. Anyway, let's, no. uh, let's move on from that. Let's leave that alone. Have you enjoyed your time at London Book Fair? I have, yeah. It's always fun. Um, I've had people wanting to take selfies with me. Again, which is, I still think is totally weird. Um, That's a bit weird. I, know, I am actually going to do it. So, there yes, it's uh, James. Here we go, uh, podcast listeners. James is now taking what a, hero. <laughs> a, podcast, a selfie with us. There you go. We'll put that up. Um, you've got a dinner tonight with Amazon. I'm I, an FI. I have. I've got a dinner with Amazon. So quite a few senior Amazonians are here tonight. So that's it's always fun. Tomorrow night, I've got a Thomas and Mercer publishing lunch. Sorry, not lunch. Um, drinks, and then we'll be. Um, and the SPF drinks? Yeah, SPF drinks uh, tomorrow night. There's no point in me telling it's you about the venue because it would have, have gone by the time this happens. Uh, James Sumner, who's a member of the SPF community, is a big Manchester City fan, so he and I are going to find a pub tonight and watch Manchester City lose to Liverpool. Uh, that's my evening planned. Thank you so much indeed for joining us for these three episodes from the London Book Fair. We are travelling the world this year, so if you want to come and meet Mark in person or say hello to either of us, uh, you can do so at Thriller Fest in New York 
in July. So that's something like July the 10th, 11th, 12th, around there if you look it up. I think probably on the Wednesday night of that week, we will host a drink somewhere, probably in the Grand Hyatt or very close to Grand Central Station in New York. So if you're within spitting distance of New York, you can get along. We will buy you, I was going to say a pint, but whatever. We'll buy you a draft beer in America. We're also going to be in Florida in... Uh, September, the end of September at Nink, and Mark is going to be at the Romance Writers Association of America, Romance Writers of America conference in Denver, Colorado, in which July is in July. July. Do you know what dates that is? Uh, it's shortly after the fest, so uh, 20th, something like that. Um, but again, yeah, Google is your friend. But yeah. Yeah, I'll be there for three days. So, if... But I think New York is a good good place for us to host. We'll do that in Florida, definitely. We'll talk about that nearer the time in September. But um, yeah, coming up in July, if you can get along to see us in New York, it would be great fun to meet you. And Mark, you can hand out some pins. Because everyone's really excited about getting an SPF pin tomorrow night when they're coming along. Because we told you on the podcast that if you come, to the SPF drinks, you're going to get a pin. So um, you'll bring the pins. I'll bring the pins. Or maybe I'll forget them. He's forgotten the pins. (laughs) You can explain that. I'm just going to tell people you're bringing the pins later. Um, Thank you indeed for watching this week. We're going to speak... I don't know what we're doing next week. We've done three in a row, so I can't remember. But it's going to be brilliant, I'm sure. Always brilliant, yes. So uh, thanks for for listening or watching. And uh, see you next week. Goodbye. You've been listening to the Self-Publishing Formula podcast. Visit us at selfpublishingformula.com for more information, show notes, and links on today's topics. You can also sign up for our free video series on using Facebook ads to grow your mailing list. If you've enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.